Hey there. Ever caught an episode of that 66 TV show where four guys stirred up a hilarious storm? Wondering what made it a timeless gem? Well, stick around because we've got some funny, shocking, and even sad facts headed your way. Remember the first time you tuned in? Nostalgia hits hard, doesn't it? Now, what do you reckon gives this show its everlasting charm? Share your thoughts, and hey, we're not done yet. We'd love to hear your most cherished memory or personal experience related to the show. Drop them in the comments below. There's a treasure trove of stories out there waiting to be shared. So buckle up for the ride through laughter and tears, and let's dive into the world of those four guys who left an indelible mark on TV history. More to come, so keep watching. The television series The Monkees holds a significant place in the history of television, even though it only ran for two seasons on the NBC television network. It played a pivotal role in shaping what later became the MTV concept, characterized by stylish videos with quick cuts, special effects, constant motion, and song accompaniments. Some critics during its time labeled the show as the Prefab 4, a nod to the Beatles' Fab 4 moniker due to perceived lack of authenticity. The show, however, faced a challenge. Rather than being a music video, it operated as a situation comedy, often featuring episodes that were light on scripting. Some even lacked a script altogether, and occasionally episodes had to be padded with additional elements. This resulted in an inconsistent viewing experience with weak or non-existent plots and a reliance on borrowed wood material from old movies, vaudeville acts, or parodies of contemporaneous programs. Despite these shortcomings, it integrated the psychedelic elements of the era into its visuals, employing brilliant colors, sets, and costumes, contributing to its enduring appeal, particularly in the iconic title sequence. While the scripted content fell short, the musical performances stood out, featuring songs crafted by notable writers such as Neil Diamond and Carole King. The discrepancy between the quality of the scripts and the songs was apparent. The show could have achieved greater success had the scripts matched the caliber of the musical performances. The 1960s, marked by a blend of factors like drugs, politics, and the youth-driven pop culture movement, greatly influenced its creation. Despite its flaws, the series managed to capture the essence of the era, offering a unique reflection of the tumultuous times. In summary, the television series made a significant impact on the cultural landscape of its time. Its contribution to the evolution of music videos and its reflection of the 1960s make it a noteworthy piece of television history. In the realm of television history, an interesting fact about the prefab for the iconic group formed for the 1966 TV series is that two members could have been known by different names. If billed by their real names, the lineup would have featured Davy, Peter, George, and Robert. Notably, Mickey Dolenz's real name is George Michael Dolenz, while Mike goes by Robert Michael Nesmith. During the original tryouts, Danny Hutton, who later found fame with Three Dog Night, auditioned but faced rejection. The TV series found its home on the Columbia Pictures studio lot, utilizing sets and props from the studio's previous collaborations with the Three Stooges in a practical and cost-effective move. Filmed with efficiency and resourcefulness, the show became a testament to repurposing within the television landscape. The monkey's journey unfolded against a backdrop of reused elements, creating a unique dynamic that contributed to its enduring appeal. This insight into the unconventional casting choices and behind-the-scenes resourcefulness adds layers to the narrative of the monkey's television journey, showcasing a distinct blend of personalities that clicked. The stage was set for their memorable on-screen chemistry, bringing a fresh and dynamic energy to the 1966 TV series. And that's the unique story behind the unconventional casting choices and behind-the-scenes resourcefulness that shaped the 1966 TV series. After the inaugural season concluded, Davy Jones withdrew from the public eye for several weeks due to a draft notice. Rumors about his health circulated, fueled by his intentional fasting for three weeks to fail the physical, a surprising success. Contrary to speculations, Charles Manson, the infamous cult leader and murderer, did not audition for the group. Manson was serving a prison sentence when the auditions took place. The intentional misspelling of monkeys in the group's name pays homage to the Beatles and their deliberately misspelled group name. This subtle nod added a touch of connection to the prevailing musical landscape. In summary, Davy Jones's disappearing act post-season, Manson's unrelated incarceration during auditions, and the clever misspelling of their name all contributed to the distinctive narrative of the group's journey. 
Halfway through its second season, the TV series took a bold step by ditching the laugh track, marking a historic moment in television. The show insisted on this change, making it the first sitcom without canned laughter, paving the way for later shows like Scrubs, Arrested Development, and Community to follow suit. Securing major sponsorships from Kellogg's Breakfast Cereals and Yardley Cosmetics of London, the program alternated weekly. Crafted humorous sponsor tags for Kellogg's Rice Krispies and Yardley Black Label Aftershave were integrated by the creators. Later, when CBS picked up the series in 1969, the advertising stint continued with Cool Aid. In 12 episodes, candid end-of-show interviews were featured as fillers, delving into various topics with the cast. One such interview explored the Sunset Strip riots of 1967, a topic cryptically explored in the lyrics of the song Daily Nightly by Michael Nesmith. From breaking laughter norms to juggling sponsors and conducting candid interviews, the TV series left an indelible mark on television, setting trends for future sitcoms. A unique blend of entertainment and marketing, the journey unfolded on screen and behind the scenes, shaping a distinctive narrative in television history. Following an intensive six-week improvisational acting course with director James Frawley, the Monkees immersed themselves in band rehearsals and recordings in the spring and early summer of 1966. Utilizing rented instruments provided by Screen Gems, they tracked numerous songs, including Michael Nesmith's The Girl I Knew Somewhere, with approximately a hundred tracks produced during this musical exploration. However, the infusion of Don Kirshner as music supervisor abruptly halted this independent creative process. During the original auditions, renowned songwriter Harry Nilsson faced rejection, but would later contribute by penning Cuddly Toy, a song covered by the group. Notably, other auditionees included Paul Williams and Stephen Stills, with Stills recommending his former roommate Peter Tork after deeming himself too old and disinterested due to Screen Gems' demand for publishing rights. Torque's casting followed, completing the group's lineup. These behind-the-scenes details shed light on the Monkees' early musical journey and the pivotal role of key figures like Kirshner in shaping their artistic direction. In assembling the cast for the series, producers placed an ad in Variety, yielding 437 hopefuls. Michael Nesmith was the sole selection from the ad, while Davy Jones and Mickey Dolenz had prior affiliations with Screen Gems. Peter Tork entered the scene through a referral from Stephen Stills. The chosen actors underwent a six-week improvisational acting course directed by James Frawley. During the second season, Monty Landis played various roles as the Monkees' recurring adversary, introducing a unique running gag. However, Landis' availability wasn't consistent. The misconception about the monkeys rejecting Sugar, Sugar led to the firing of Don Kirshner as the series' musical supervisor. In reality, Kirshner's dismissal resulted from his unauthorized release of A Little Bit Me, A Little Bit You With She Hangs Out. The latter, recorded in New York without the other monkeys' knowledge, led to Kirshner's departure when it gained traction in the U.S. These behind-the-scenes dynamics, from casting choices to musical disputes, add depth to the series' narrative, shaping a distinctive journey in television history. In crafting their music, the Monkees underwent a notable shift with the release of their third album, Headquarters. Prior albums featured vocals only, with no instrumental contributions from the members. However, at Michael Nesmith's insistence, Peter Tork played guitar on Papa Jean's blues from their debut album. The third album marked a departure, with the band singing and playing on every track, a practice they continued until their breakup in 1970. This trend reversed briefly for their 1996 comeback LP, Justice. The iconic Monkeymobile, a modified 1966 Pontiac G2, holds a distinct place in the series. Three versions were created, featuring unique details. The first Monkeymobile included a real supercharger, tan interior, and lacked the logo initially. The subsequent two had fake superchargers, white interiors, and convertible tops, each with different sized logos on the doors. In 1966, Michael Nesmith took on a significant role, producing nearly 12 recording sessions for the TV series and other artist albums. These sessions showcased the distinctive sound of a Danelectro bass, played by bassist Robert West, producing a percussive plucking sound. Notably, Nesmith aimed to involve fellow monkeys Peter Tork, Davy Jones, and Mickey Dolenz in these musical endeavors. 